Good morning, everyone. Good morning and welcome to day two of the uh, NSAC conference. I hope uh, you enjoyed yesterday. We had very good uh, keynote speeches and good talks from the students and from the feedback that I've got from delegates. You, you all did pretty well yesterday. Well done. And we're looking forward to the talks today. Um, so, as you can see from this slide already up, we have another keynote speech. We are delighted to have Sir Harry Badisha with us this morning to give a talk. Um, you heard the presentation of one of his students yesterday. Um, so, just before I start, just like yesterday, just for those who weren't here, uh, a couple of housekeeping, housekeeping items. Uh, there's no fire alarm testing today as well. Uh, so if you hear it, it's a real one. Please use the fire exits uh, on either side of the room. And the assembly point is uh, outside in front of the county through double doors. Um, the toilets are, you know where they are, just, just through, through those doors. Um, and that's pretty much it. I, again, if I can ask the delegates to use these forms to mark the students, that would be great, and hand them back to uh, the NSERT colleagues, or just leave them uh, on the blue trays uh, near the doors, that would be great. So, the agenda for today, we have a uh, morning session after the keynote speech, and uh, same as yesterday, we'll break into two rooms, and the uh, break will be around 11, 10 past 11, we'll have lunch, and then a couple of <coughs> other uh, presentations in the afternoon and there will be a networking session and also there's a workshop by the conversation um, which I think the students who are attending have already registered so if you only need to attend if you've registered and it's uh, uh, I think, which meeting room is it? G, G3 okay. um, there will also be an award ceremony at uh, half past three this afternoon so uh, I'd like you to stay if you can, especially delegates uh, as well as you can. Um, I'm sure the students will be here because some of you may be winning the awards, so make sure you're here. Okay. Um, we we'll need to move on. So Sorry. I think the conversation workshop overlap with the awards ceremony. I apologize. No, no, that's not right. There will be a networking session in parallel with the conversation workshop for those who are not attending the conversation workshop. Okay. Um, but you'll have plenty of networking opportunities because there'll be lunchtime and coffee break, so uh, maybe it's not. Thank you. Um, okay, um, I'd like to introduce the, our final uh, keynote speaker. Uh, he's very modest and he's asked me not to give a long introduction, but perhaps he can tell us a little bit himself about his background. So without any further delay, please give a warm welcome to Sir Harry. Fisher. and I'm glad you emphasized that this marking sheet is only for the students, okay? <laughs> <laughs> now, um, it's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, this is the place where innovation happens in a big way. So I took these pictures yesterday, and this is just the latest, uh, you know, the, the only process invented in welding in the last 50 years or so is friction stir welding, and it's, it's spread like a disease all over the world, yeah? <laughs> So these are just two examples, but you can find rich and stir welding everywhere now. So there is no better setting for NSERC than this place. Uh, innovation and application of science and imagination happens here all the time. And Tatian, I, I was very impressed by what you said yesterday. How many, how this has grown, I mean, just look at this audience. It was nothing, uh, it was just a twinkle in your eye a few years ago. <laughs> so, thank you for giving me this opportunity. When I was asked to give this talk, uh, there was no mention of a topic. So I thought I would talk about this, and it turns out that it's actually very relevant <coughs> to what you've been saying. So, for, for example, uh, the colored ones are the talks that I was able to attend yesterday, and these were in parallel sessions. But all of these topics, are relevant to what I'm going to talk about next. Okay, so the methods of pattern recognition and winning games against uh, uh, human beings, you know, the Go, for example, the recent uh, 
beating of the world champion in Korea. All that sort of stuff represents uh, very complex problems for which we don't have the basic science. So we use all kinds of methods to deal with that. We also saw uh, Richard Clegg's keynote lecture yesterday where he said there is a connection with the Alan Turing Institute. And that, I think, uh, will lead to much more activity in this sort of an area, because there is some mathematics involved. And people talk about artificial intelligence, but what I'm going to show you today is that there is no intelligence in this. It is very simple mathematics. <coughs> but before I go into that, I'm going to talk a little bit about graphene to set the scene here, yeah, because we had the lecture yesterday by Richard Fleck, uh, where he showed this picture of um, the Nobel Prize winner. And you know, the citation in the Nobel Prize is that you know they did an in incredibly simple experiment by putting tape on gra graphite to pull up a layer. Because the graphene itself was known. I mean, you can find literature referring to single layers of uh, <coughs> carbon a long time before uh, the tape experiment. But I disagreed with something else that Richard Clegg said. He said, you know, that uh, it is spawning many new technologies. And if you go to the Manchester <coughs> University website, they make all kinds of claims about graphene being a disruptive technology, and that is 200 times stronger than steel, all of which is nonsense, okay? So very often uh, in universities, we have the habit of making claims that we've achieved technology before it's actually been achieved. It is not simple, and I will show you why it's not simple to uh, create new technologies. So you cannot have a disruptive technology if it's not actually a technology. Yet. So there is no significant output from graphene apart from science, which is good. There's no problem. I don't have a problem with that, but it's certainly not a technology. And you know, we don't seem to learn the lessons at all, because all of these from history, where metallic glass was going to take over the world, you know, it was supposed to be the next revolution after the Bronze Age. And di thin diamond films, buckyballs, nanotubes, and right now high entropy alloys. There are so many claims about this which are totally unjustified in terms of producing something that is like friction scale welding. Okay. It is really difficult to take an idea and create an industry out of it. And the second keynote lecture uh, by um, Dr. Brin Burn, <laughs> okay, uh, was actually much more founded on real uh, territory. That to go from basic technology, you have to go through a whole set of steps, which are called technology readiness levels. Uh, you also have to be able to manufacture the material. So there are manufacturing uh, readiness levels, and then the business has to be ready to do that. Now, Lee Smith from BP was here yesterday, and we started a project with BP uh, about four years ago, where they asked us to create a steel which is hydrogen resistant for undersea structures. And we did it, and we patented it, and demonstrated its properties, and so on. But the business case has disappeared. Yeah, the oil price has gone down to $40 a barrel. There is no way you're going to invest in undersea exploration, difficult extraction of oil. So what I want to emphasize, you know, you are students, is don't get fooled by claims about new materials and sexy subjects. It is incredibly difficult to get to a technology range level of seven. And once you get to this point, it requires heavy commitment by industry to take the idea forward because it's a huge expense to do that. So unless industry is serious, you will not get past this technology readiness level four. And we have created a shaft steel recently, which is going to go beyond technology readiness level four in Rolls Royce because the business case <coughs> collapses if we don't have this shaft material. So what um, Dr. Byrne pointed out is that you know there has to be a need somewhere for uh, for this technology, for it to go forward rapidly. Of course, we also had Steve Jobs mentioned yesterday, and he created the needs. 
So there is another scenario you can work on. He actually said that people don't know what they need, right? And he created the need. Okay, so having said that, let me show you why it's uh, very, very difficult to do certain things. So this is uh, a slide showing the typical materials department, and you could put uh, you know, TWI in this. You have all kinds of subjects. You have device materials, physical metallurgy, chemistry, biomaterials, polymers, and ceramics. And all of these subjects are not that different. They all share techniques of characterization. And characterization mean, can mean a very large fatigue test, or it can mean looking at atoms inside your material. But they also have mathematical modeling of one kind or another. And the reason for this uh, is that basically we can no longer wait for 25 years before an idea gets into practice. And mathematical models are not, uh, not at all advanced enough to deal with the sort of complex problems that we are faced with in materials. But nevertheless, you can reduce the time scale in going from an idea to a product by throwing characterization and materials modeling at these problems. Now, there are many, many aspects of materials modeling. You know, you can have electron theory. So, for example, uh, there are no thermodynamic data for the effect of silicon on cementite because its solubility is next to zero inside cementite. So, we have to use first principles methods to create those data and then put them into a phase diagram calculation. So all of these methods actually exist. Irreversible thermodynamics is simply between thermodynamics and kinetics. Uh, you know, for, for example, if you have a thermocouple, then it's a temperature gradient that's creating the current. Okay? So there's a force coming from a temperature gradient which is driving the current. So uh, if you have diffusion happening and you put an electrical current through the system, that will aid the diffusion of matter. The irreversible thermodynamics deals with that aspect. You have finite element analysis. We saw that yesterday. Uh, the big area, huge area, where things are missing completely is structure and properties. So uh, I will give you examples of that. We do not know how to calculate properties. Okay. We saw some attempts yesterday. There was a talk which said prediction of CTOD. But when I listened to the talk, there was no prediction you know, it was a measurement of CTOD. So there is a huge area which is missing completely from materials modeling. And, you know, the engineer is not interested in atoms or even how beautiful an image looks. They actually need properties to design their materials. Now, of course, we are very close to Cambridge. And there have been a lot of movies about Cambridge. Can anyone tell me the titles of any of the movies? Theory of everything, very good. So here, here is the slide. <laughs> theory of everything. So apparently Stephen Hawking claims that he has the theory of everything. But if I asked him to predict any one of these properties, okay, he would not be able to do that. If I ask anybody in the world to predict any of these properties, if I give them a comprehensive description of the structure, the composition, the processing of the material, no one in the world can predict any of these properties. Okay. So you can contradict me if, if you like. Uh, but I have said this at many, many meetings all over the world. And you cannot predict even the simple tensile test. So this is a summary. All, all properties can be measured. And of course, uh, when you measure the properties, you can then uh, create designs of engineering structures which are likely to be safe. Okay, so that's the whole point of measuring the properties. Uh, and you can also use those measurements in control. But if I give you a comprehensive description of the material, including process structure, it is not possible to predict even the most simple properties. <coughs> but there are vast quantities of data in the literature, huge quantities, because we've been doing experiments for a very, very long time. Okay, they might be dispersed all over the place, but there are vast quantities of data. And TWI, more than anything, uh, more than anywhere else, has huge quantities of experimental data. Okay. That means the knowledge is there to exploit. So just to give you an example, uh, this, is my, uh, this was my student, uh, Tracy Koo. 
and she's about five feet ten inches high. Okay. So look at the scale of this steam turbine. That's expected to rotate at about 3,000 <coughs> RPM and last for 40 years with a steam temperature of about 600 degrees centigrade. That is real technology. Okay. So the number of variables involved in the steel that goes into a steam turbine, here is a conservative list. All of these elements, some of them are in parts per million concentration, but they have a profound effect on the properties of the material. Uh, thermomechanical processing, uh, the welding consumables, which are used to join bits inside the rotor, uh, many different kinds of welding processes and parameters, and then there is a whole, a whole series of heat treatments before you actually put it into service. Now, there is no theory which can take account of all of these variables. So the normal way of science is that you simplify. Okay? But, you know, the problem is if you simplify, you lose the technology completely. You can write a paper, but you lose the technology completely. So let me illustrate that. So here is a series of points, uh, plotting <coughs> y against x. And I think you'll agree that's a fairly random series of points, right? Yeah, I can't see any real correlation there. But <coughs> if I now add another variable, which is pointing outside of this uh, board, and a fourth variable, which is time, the picture becomes immediately clear. Right. So watch this, uh, assuming the movie works. Yeah, it's obvious what this is, right? So by ignoring two variables, you completely lost the information about what this is about. So we are not allowed to simplify if we want to deal with the complexity that is typical in technology. Right? So how do we go about doing this? Well, uh, I'll give you the answer first, uh, that we must have nonlinear function. Okay? There's nothing in nature to say that things should be linear. Uh, we have to be able to deal with very large numbers of variables, and it's extremely important to address uncertainties. And I'll show you there are two kinds of uncertainties, and we need to exploit the knowledge that already exists okay, by combining huge quantities of data. Now, how do we do this? Uh, well, you know, you're all used to carbon equivalents, right? Yeah, that's basically a, a regression equation, uh, something like this. This isn't a carbon equivalent, but say this is the yield strength, then we write it as a function of the amount of carbon, manganese, nickel, and so forth. Perfectly reasonable thing to do. Uh, it's an empirical representation of the data because we don't know how the strength should vary with manganese. But then, you know, you go to your supervisor and says, look, I know that uh, the effect of carbon is not independent of manganese, right? So you add another term here, which is carbon multiplied by manganese. Yeah, I don't know why I should multiply it, but you know, at least it, there's an interaction. And then, you know, after some celebrations, you have a, a bad dream. You might write it as a sine of carbon and a hyperbolic tangent of manganese. Okay. So the problem that I'm highlighting is that because it is a complicated problem, I don't actually know what function I should use to represent the data. So there is a method where we actually discover the function. But before I go into that, I'm going to represent this equation here using a picture. Okay. So this is a, a neural network representation of that regression equation. I have my inputs here, which might be the carbon, the yield strength, and the phosphorus concentration, and I want to estimate the toughness, say the choppy toughness. So what I do is I take the carbon, I multiply it by a random number, this is the weight. I take the phosphorus, multiply it by another random number, and yield strength, <coughs> another random number, and I add them all up here in a hidden unit. Okay, so this is the terminology of uh, neural network. And I work out a value of toughness, which is not going to be correct, because I've used random numbers. But I have some experimental data, so I can go back and modify those weights until I get uh, uh, some agreement. So that's basically a regression analysis. But it's linear. How can I make it nonlinear? Well, if I take this and then I make that an argument of a hyperbolic tangent, so a hyperbolic tangent looks like this, I've made it nonlinear. 
And the advantage of this function is that it's very flexible. So depending on the values of the weights, it can be very linear in a certain regime, or it can be gentle or steep. Okay, so it's a very flexible nonlinear function. But it's still not sufficiently flexible. However, if I add another hyperbolic tangent there, I've made it even more complicated, right? So I've got as much nonlinearity <coughs> as I like. Now, adding this second hyperbolic tangent uh, modifies that diagram that I illustrated earlier. So instead of just doing the operations on one hidden unit, I multiply it by another set of weights here for the second hyperbolic tangent. Uh, so I have now here two hidden units, and I can address a more complicated problem because it can be more flexible. I can carry on this. I can go on adding more hyperbolic tangents to get arbitrary uh, complexity. So a neural network is nothing more than what I've explained here. And there is a very simple equation here where this is our output and this is our input and we are simply uh, multiplying the inputs by weights, making them an argument of the hyperbolic tangent and we might throw in some constants as we do in regression analysis. <coughs> this, there is no, nothing black box about the neural network. It's a straightforward mathematical equation. Maybe very long if you have lots of variables and lots of hyperbolic tangents, but it is explicit. If I put in a value of x, I will always get the same value of y. There's nothing, uh, it doesn't work like the brain. The title neural network implies some connection with the brain, but it is far more simple, simpler than the brain. Okay, so let me show you. Um, how flexible this function is. So here I have uh, a function and it's a hyperbolic tangent of two variables, x and y. And if I vary the weights, you see this surface singing and dancing, okay? All I'm doing is varying the weights. I mean, that's remarkable. The equation is exactly the same, okay? just varying the weights. You can make <coughs> it incredibly flexible. Okay. Uh, so have we solved the problem? I don't think so. So here's a question for you again, just to see if you're awake. Uh, is the straight line a better representation than this polynomial, which passes through every point? Which one would you pick? Hmm? So, you know, whatever answer you give will be wrong. <laughs> Beca because we don't know what function should pass through the points. It could be that this is perfectly correct, the one that is passing through every single point with zero error, or it could be that this is the correct one because we have a certain level of noise. But given the complexity of the problem, we don't know what the function should be. So how do we decide? Well, it's, re it's very simple. If I try to make a prediction and the predicted value falls here, then the polynomial is correct. If I, if, my predict uh, if I make a prediction and the correct value falls here, then the straight line is so. What you can do is you can express your data into two parts. So this is your data set. You divide it into a test data set and a training data set. Training data set is the one with which you create the function. And the test is you expose that function to, to see how it generalizes. So here, for example, the um, white dots represent data which are not seen by the model. And the black dots are the ones with which you create the model. And you can see that you're not predicting well with a straight line. Okay. The uh, test error is large when your model is too simple. Okay. Now, if I make my model too complicated, it represents the training data extremely well. Yeah, so I get a reduction in the training error, but I make poor predictions of data which have not been seen by the model. The test error will go through a minimum according to the complexity of your model. And this is the optimum model. So it behaves well in regions where the model has not seen data. Okay. Everyone happy with that? Okay, so let me ha uh, pose another question. Uh, I've got a sequence of numbers. What are the next two numbers? 
Be brave. <laughs> Sorry? Ten. Ten, yeah, correct. 10 and 12. Okay. Oh, oh, 16, 32. Okay, so let's just go with 10 and 12 for the moment, all right? 10 and 12. Uh, we've done a, a linear extrapolation. But look, uh, if I use this equation and I put the number 2 in here, I will get exactly 4. If I put four, I'll get exactly six. If I put six, I'll get exactly eight. If I put eight, I will get 8.91, all right? So these data have absolutely no noise, all right? Uh, you know, they're, they're just numbers. So we can't use noise as a, as a parameter. And within the domain where we know, we have the information like 2468, both of these models exactly predict the correct result. Outside of that domain, they behave differently. And there is nothing you can do about this. Both models are exactly correct. Okay. Uh, given that we don't have the science, we don't know whether this is the one that should work or this one. But there's another point I want you to notice. How do we express this problem? Because I don't have a solution. We have two models. One is linear and one is nonlinear. And they behave differently outside of the domain of known information. So this error we call the modeling uncertainty. It's not the sort of error when you repeat an experiment and some variable is not controlled, you get a different answer. So if you do two tensile tests, you're not going to get exactly the same answer. Uh, that is that is what we call noise. This is, we have more than one model which can represent the same data precisely. So here the modeling error is very large, here it is small, and here it is zero. Okay. So you need to think about two different kinds of errors whenever you use an empirical representation of data. First is the noise in the experimental data, and the second is the modeling uncertainty. And we had a talk yesterday about Bayesian methods. And this is the essence of the Bayesian method, that you not only have the information about noise in the data, but also how your model behaves when you extrapolate. And the most interesting work is done in regions where you extrapolate. You don't want to do work where there already exists knowledge. And here's a different way to represent that. Here, we have three different models which reasonably represent the data, okay, known data, but they behave completely differently in domains where we don't have data. So here we put an error bar, which is the modeling uncertainty, gives you an idea that you need to be careful about your interpretation of the model. Doesn't mean that a prediction you made in this region is wrong, but you need to be careful because you're working in a domain where knowledge is non-existent. That is very useful information. Yeah, because when you have 125 variables, you don't know whether you have the right combination of variables in this region of the input space. But if you get a large modeling uncertainty, that's the region in which you want to do new experiments. So here's an example. I can give you dozens and dozens of examples that uh, we have uh, solved using this method. So this is the fusion reactor. And you know, the typical damage that we will get for materials is 200 displacements per atom over the life of the material facing the plasma. In other words, every atom in the material will be displaced from its equilibrium position 200 times during the lifetime. Can you imagine that? Okay? If you tell an ordinary person that I'm going to knock every atom out of you 200 times, they <coughs> will not be happy. Okay? <laughs> And uh, in, a fusion uh, in a fission reactor, the damage level is much smaller, at around 30 displacements per atom. Now, there is no experimental equipment which can give you a dose of 200 displacements per atom for us to be able to test a material. Right? So the only thing you can do is modeling. And why do we need to do modeling? Uh, it's not actually to design the material. But there will be an experimental facility in the not-so-distant future uh, specifically designed to give a dose of 200 dPa. But the amount of 
volume which will experience that level of damage is really quite small. So you have to select very carefully the experiments that you're going to put into that volume. Right. Uh, it's a bit like doing experiments in space where you, know, you can't have lots and lots of experiments going on and you have to select the experiments. So we created uh, neural network models in the Bayesian framework using uh, data from standard nuclear databases. Uh, and the amazing thing, right, is that these databases contain information about the seals and so on, but no information whatsoever about the heat treatment. Now, how can this be? Yeah. Any undergraduate metallurgist will tell you that the properties of the steel depend not just on the chemical composition. But in the nuclear industry, <coughs> There is no information in these databases on the heat treatment of materials. So that is going to introduce a certain level of noise because we are ignoring some important variables. Nothing you can do about it because they did not record any of the heat treatments. It's extraordinary, really. And I suspect it's because physicists were involved. Okay? Right, so we created the models. I had a physicist in Cambridge ask me, what is the toughness of steel? And when I tried to explain to him that there is no unique number, you have to tell me what kind of steel, he said, but there must be a value of toughness of steel, okay? So this is the kind of problem you face. So here are some predictions where I'll be looking at the yield stress and the damage level and the temperature to which the material is exposed. and. Uh, you know, the, the material embrittles, it becomes harder and harder with uh, higher dose levels. So just bear this slide in mind, uh, and I'll show you now the uncertainties. Okay, same plot, but now we are plotting the uncertainty. And you can see that the uncertainties are very large in this region, okay? Ridiculously large. And that's the modeling uncertainty. And that means that if you want to do experiments, don't bother with doing experiments in this region where the uncertainties are small. In this very limited volume you have, you put samples which are in the domain where the uncertainty is very large. And the number of variables is large, so this is a good method for identifying where to do experiments. Now, I mentioned to you uh, steam turbines, and this is another nice picture of proper engineering. And we want to increase the steam temperatures to 700 or 750 degrees centigrade. And many, many years of research, including in TWI, under the so-called cost programs and so on, failed to produce a ferritic steel which can survive at 650 degrees centigrade, 100 megapascals, <coughs> and 40 years. So we have to find another material for this. And of course, uh, there are many materials which have high creep strength at even higher temperatures. So, you know, you know, this is our aircraft engine, and the blade is actually serving, uh, the blade in the middle here, is in an environment which is at 1700 degrees centigrade, higher than its melting point. Okay. So, the trouble is, those blades are incredibly expensive. You cannot make a huge power station out of those nickel-based super alloys. It would be unbelievably expensive. Uh, the cost of a blade is more than that of gold of the same weight. Okay. So, we were asked to reverse engineer the nickel-based super alloy because we don't need an environment of 1700 degrees centigrade. We only want to go to 700 degrees centigrade. Uh, so we started by removing all of the important alloying additions, okay, and we even included iron because um, uh, the value of scrap, nickel scrap, if it contains iron, goes down dramatically. Right. Iron is not a good thing for very high temperature applications of superalloy. And we came up with this uh, composition after doing some mathematical modeling, and it's uh, strengthened with uh, gamma prime precipitates, but a much smaller volume fraction than in the turbine planes. Of course, we had to predict properties, so we created a neural network model based on literature to predict a whole variety of properties, and this was our prediction 
these are the uncertainties. And these were experiments which were done long after the predictions were made. Okay. So you can see that without actually doing a whole series of alloys and testing them, the first time we have uh, uh, results which agree in terms of the high temperature strength. And the same applies for the pre-fracture. Now notice this is the modeling uncertainty. So we are working in an alloy system which doesn't actually exist in the database. Yeah. And we call this alloy FT750DC. FT is after Frank Donfre, who was my postdoc. Okay. And uh, 750 is the steam temperature, and DC is dirt cheap. <laughs> okay, so we reverse engineered the alloy to make it cheap enough for this. Now, NSERC is about structural integrity, so I've told in a bit about structural integrity, and fatigue is uh, an important part of structural integrity. So we created a model for the fatigue resistance of steels. And the inputs are these, okay? So there's nothing here about the chemical composition or the heat treatment, because these properties should depend on that. Okay, so these are our input variables. And the vertical uh, distance simply represents how, how much of the output that each of those variables explains, correct? So um, I'm going to show you a series of plots of the prediction of the crack growth rate uh, versus various uh, parameters. And the points on there were not in the data used to create the model. So here is uh, steel, and you can see that the predictions are quite good. Correct. Now, I said to you that the model doesn't have anything about chemical composition or heat treatment. And it's completely based on data from steel. But if it doesn't have anything about chemical composition or heat treatment, then maybe it'll work for other materials. Okay. So let's see. No data whatsoever on nickel alloys included in the creation of the model. Look. Okay. No data whatsoever on titanium or aluminum alloys. And it works. Because the basic parameters that we use for training the model are independent of the material type. And these parameters are more easy to measure. Okay. So even in an empirical method, you can introduce some physics. Okay. So you need not use a raw input. You can use an input which is a function of several inputs if you know the physics of that part of the problem. OK, so I think that is my uh, last slide. But you can find uh, a, a review of the subject uh, on, on my website here. And lots and lots of other information on this method. And you know, uh, I think you uh, explained that there's a lot of fun involved in this as well, and you showed the slide of uh, punting. But we are also very keen on cycling, long distance cycling. So I will send you an email of our next adventure, and all of you are welcome to join. Because you know, while we are cycling, we are discussing things like this. <laughs> <laughs> so I will finish there, and I'll be very happy to answer questions. I've left time for questions. Okay.